pause. So I was uh, telling Mark earlier, uh, since we're quarantining, he, and I had to went ahead and texted him and let him know that we weren't going to be doing it in person as part of this. I went looking online to see if I could find someone who had already done the work of the cyclorama of Revelation. And so I typed in Google Revelation and cyclorama. And you know what? Of the top 10 results, two of them were my Zoom recording on YouTube of Bible study. Really? <laughs> That's great. Uh, and most of them were about the cyclorama that's down in Atlanta that has to do with the Civil War. Mm. Mm. So needless to say, I actually spent the afternoon starting to do my diagram, like I told you guys I wanted to do for next week. Or mm. well, for whenever I get it done. So yeah, that was what I spent my day doing is trying to dissect all the sections and and work on us on creating the diagram of a cyclorama. Well, I'm proud of you. It kind of makes me feel a little weird though. It's done. Not out. Can you see her? No. Hello. Sorry, it's been one of those days. It's all right. I just about set off the smoke alarm a second ago, so. Oh, fun. <laughs> At a funeral this morning, and then, you know, that just, the whole day is just kind of a bummer, so. Well, we haven't said prayer yet. I was just telling them about my searching for Revelation Cycloramas and found out that nobody has put it out on the internet yet, so. Except you. Except me. Wow. You're, so, you're always so ahead of yourself. That's better than being full of yourself. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or behind yourself. That's a good one, Sharon. <laughs> On that note, I think we probably need to pray. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for an opportunity to gather with friends. And Lord, just to look at your word. I pray that you'll be with us tonight uh, as we are in our different locations. Lord, may your spirit unite us in you. May you unite us in truth. And Lord, may you speak to us through your word. May we hear what you have to say. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 So last week we uh, finished the seventh seal. And so this week we're at the trumpets. Um I figured we would try, and I looked at my list of what we're supposed to do or what I originally slated for us to do, and um, we are supposed to go through the end of chapter nine, so I kind of figure that's what we'll try and do. That's the, the, the trumpets, and, uh, but I want to go ahead and read, even though we read this last week, I want to go ahead and read the first part of chapter eight just kind of as context. And then uh, we'll move into the trumpets. Does it sound good? Sounds yeah. good. All right. So hopping in, uh, eight, uh, chapter one, or eight, chapter eight, verses one through six, and then into verse seven for our first trumpet. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour, which, by the way, Hannah has said that so many times and sent me like, texts and things like that about a half an hour since last week it's it's not even funny but so about a half an hour and i saw the seven the seven angels who stand before god and to them were given seven trumpets then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there was noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. 
So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first trumpet sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the grasses were burned up. So, what do you think? Is this some kind of cleansing, being it's one third of? So, there's a little bit of a play on words with this, because um, if one third is taken, what's left? Two thirds. Two thirds. But what is two thirds in a number value in a decimal point? Ooh. I'm an English. Oh, I got it. <laughs> Anybody else know what it is? I can't think of what it is. Well, what's one third in a decimal point? Anybody know? No. Go ahead and share. Point three. Point three. It's three, 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 three. So what's two thirds? What's point three 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 times two? Six. Six six six. Oh. It's six six six. <laughs> Yeah. Sharon just got it. Yeah. And the light bulb goes off, you go, oh, wait. It's less about a literal third, and it's more talking about, again, this mentality of is this the kingdom of Babylon, the fallen Babylon, or is this the kingdom of God? And so, Dan, it's, there's a sense in which you're right. This could be about cleansing. Mm. Because what remains is 666. But again, I think I don't think that this is literally meant to be one third is burned up and two thirds remains. It's talking about this this worldly bab fallen Babylonian reality that what remains after God enacts judgment is that which he is judging. The two thirds, those who take the mark, those who live under the perception of Satan and the fallen Babylon. Which is unfortunately the vast majority. Which is unfortunately the vast majority. I mean, if you take these numbers literally, we will never win an election. That's the truth. But again, I don't think, I mean, think back to what he said back here at, at verse one. It's about a half an hour. He doesn't really know how long it is. And so he's, he's giving us a clue. This is not about exact numbers. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so it's not, it really isn't about a third of, of the trees and grass as if we could, okay, well, this two thirds is okay and this third is not. This is about kingdom realities going on here. What was your, um, read your verse, I need to take these contacts out, I kind of see, verse six again. Verse six, so the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Mine, mine is a little clearer. It says, and the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. That's a little clearer, yeah. A little clearer. I was like, yours, I was like, what? Um, <clears throat> sorry, I just wanted to hear that again. Mm -hmm. 
Any other thoughts? We may come back to it because I think we uh, think it'll the pieces will start to add together and it'll make the first one make more sense. Well, let's read the next trumpet then, verses eight and nine. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. I will say, I think that this time, it's literally talking about a literal sea. This is not the the spiritual sea that is that we mm. talked about a couple of chapters back that it was the sea within the temple. We're, to, we're dealing with created order in a, in a sense here. Okay. So the first trumpet talks about the plant and animal life. The second trumpet is talking about the seas and that which dwells within the sea and that which moves about the sea. And so the second one is what? The seas and what? Uh, the seas and the life within the sea. It, mine says it's thrown into the sea and the sea became blood. Living creatures in the sea died and the ships that were on the sea were destroyed. And of course, realistically, what uh, what's this picturing here? I mean, when you hear these words, is there something that you are reminded of from them? Genesis. Somewhat of Genesis. Where else did the sea become blood? Oh, the curses. Curses. Mm -hmm. Well, in Egypt, where the river became blood. There you go. Yeah, the curses. This, yeah. Curses, plagues, uh, the plagues of Egypt. It's this is meant to evoke that same imagery of God's judgment on Egypt as it is. God's judgment now on humanity or the world. Um, Don, I don't think you were involved in the Bible study, but I know, uh, I think we've talked about it before. The plagues of Egypt, you can do some work where they actually correspond to Egyptian deities. Each day seems to attack a different deity within the Egyptian pantheon. Huh. And so there's a sense in which, yes, God is is sending these plagues on Egypt, but what he's actually doing is he's doing war with the gods of Egypt. And so humanity is affected by it, but it's really a, a almost a cosmic battle, if that makes sense. And I'm, I think I talked to you guys about that before, haven't I? Mm -hmm. Not me. Maybe, so not you, but... So a lot of this imagery, if you go back and you look at it, it's it kind of has this, I mean, hail and fire in, in the, the first trumpet. Fiery hail is one of the plagues with Egypt. Uh, you know, the river being blood is a plague in Egypt. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So there is a sense in which where a lot of the up, revelation up to this point was taking temple imagery with the trumpets. It's taking Exodus imagery. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about the second trumpet? No. Okay. The third trumpet. Verse 10 and going through 11. Then the third angel sounded, and a great star from the heaven burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of the water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood. 
And many men died from the water because it was bitter. Poison. Does your, do, do any of your translations say it differently? I've got the same one as you. Mine says just a little tiny bit different, but it says um, um, the, the 11 B, it says a third of the waters turned bitter. I think yours said wormwood. And then many people died from the waters that had become bitter. I've got a note here that that notion of wormwood comes from Jeremiah 9, verse 15. I didn't mark it, so give me a second. Verse 15? Jeremiah yeah, 9, mean, verse 15. I had that written down too. Uh, so the paragraph that that's contained in is 13 through 16, and it says, and the Lord said, because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, nor walked according to it, but have walked according to the dictates of their own hearts, and after the veils which their fathers taught them, therefore says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will feed them, this people with wormwood, and give them water of gall to drink. I will scatter them also among the Gentiles, whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send a sword after them until I have consumed them. I feel like there was another part of that was wormwood, but maybe I'm, I'm thinking wrong. Um, but the notion of bitter waters, there that's another exodus uh, um, imagery. Where they came across the water and it was bitter, and so Moses threw the stick in, and all of a sudden the water was able to be drank. Yeah, and even talked about how it was sweet or something. Sweetened water, yeah. There, but it, it has to do with that that reality of Jeremiah that the people are following after the Baals. The people are following after false gods. They're following the fallen Babylon. And therefore, he's giving them bitter water to drink. That there's going to come with it a bitter cup, a retribution. They think they're getting something that's good for them, that we get to follow our own gods. We get to follow what makes us happy and what we like. But with that comes the bitter pill. And so, again, there's. Uh, I think that this is really about the Egyptian... And, uh, imagery here that even though God pulled the people out of slavery and made them his people and now even though Jesus has come and paid the price for their sin and removed them from their slavery yet still they're choosing to follow other gods mm. we're pretty slow learners <laughs> you think I mean just look at history uh. You know, there's a sense in which you can look here, too. Um, so we've dealt with the plant life. Then we've dealt with the saltwater life. And now we're dealing with freshwater life. Fresh. I was going to ask you, what was this one? Freshwater life. Okay. Um and all three of them being struck are going to do what? Make living on Earth impossible, or nearly. Exactly. It's going to make living a lot harder. That by our, there's a sense in which God is saying because of their actions, they're bringing these consequences on themselves, and it's actually going to make living in my world more difficult. We're polluting our world. I didn't really want to go there, but yeah, I think there's that's what I was thinking too. And I just realized I may have to run and go unlock the door. Uh, we've got NA tonight. So I'm going to pause here in a little bit. Let's go ahead and read the fourth trumpet. 
uh, verses 12 through the end of the chapter. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, an saying angel? with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Mine's I heard an eagle. Yep. Where's your eagle? Verse 13, well. as I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair. I have an angel. Yeah, so an angel. apparently, I've got a little marker here that the Masoretic text, so we're talking about uh, the, the Hebrew version of this says eagle. The oh. Greek version says angel. Oh. Hmm. Which one is right? I'm, I'm not for sure. Um, Does it matter? It matters in something that I thought of when he read it. But we don't hear much about angels flying. Uh, I've heard people argue, do guardian angels have wings or don't they have? And I've heard people really dislike pictures that were supposed to portray guardian angels because of their wings. And are there many places where angels fly in the Bible? Hmm. So being real honest, if you were to do a study in scripture, you will never find the word angel used with a creature that has wings. Mm. Uh, angel does mean messenger, God's messenger. And they always bring a message from God with them. And we have here in Revelation and, and in Isaiah, the picture of seraphim. And seraphim have wings. They have three sets of wings. Mm -hmm. Wings to fly with, wings to cover their face, and wings to cover their feet. What about the um, multitude of angels at um, at birth, at Christ's birth? They appeared, but does it say they were flying? It doesn't say they were flying. It just says they appeared in the heaven. They're a heavenly host. Hosts, okay. There appeared a heavenly host. But it doesn't say they're flying. It doesn't even say they're in the air. Doesn't even say they're angels, actually, does it? And it doesn't even say they're angels. Heavenly yeah. messengers. Mm. Well, heavenly hosts could be those that have already gone on. I mean, that's a good point. Heavenly host could be everyone that was in the white robes that we heard read about a couple weeks ago. Right. So it could be that beyond time us looks into time <laughs> on Jesus's birth. Cyclorama. Cyclorama. It's so now what is the fourth? What is this one then? Is this um the heaven so, or this or this the so it atmosphere? says heaven. This but this time it's not talking about the realm of God, it's talking about the cosmos. Cosmos, okay. Um you know, we're we're literally talking sun the galaxies, cosmos, those kind of things. Hmm. The cosmos, wanna, galaxies, and all of the above. I want to pause this real quick. And I'm going to go run and unlock the church. And as she get, she leaves. I'm back. So mm. swapping out. So the fourth angel. This is affecting the cosmos, the galaxies, the physical heavens. And and so you have this this reality here of the choices of humanity to choose to follow anyone other than God affects all of the natural order around us. So we've had plant life in one, ocean life and that which is under the sea in two, the fresh water and therefore every, all of humanity and the animal life that's on the, the earth in three, and now we've got the cosmos, the universe in four.
there's a sense in which God is, well, he's just outright saying it. Our actions have consequences. And again, because he keeps using this motif of a third, I don't think he's talking about a literal third. He's, he's speaking in, in metaphor here, if that makes sense. The other side of it is, and I had a note here, I was looking through as I was doing my, my digging. The springs of living water in the third trumpet actually are the source of the seas. Mm -hmm. mm. And, you know, depending on how you talk to them, talk to people, the heavens rain down on us and so that becomes the source of even the springs and so there's there's a sense of all of the all of humanity all of the created order is being dealt with in these first four trumpets um if you remember last week i said in these three sets of seven uh we're going to see them divided into a four and a three the first four, in this case, the first four are dealing with uh, the created order, and the, the last four will deal with uh, something else. Uh, with the seals, the first four had the, th the four horses, and the last three were the effects of those three horse, those four horses, right? And so you're going to see that playing out here too. And then also within those uh, sets of seven, we'll see the interlude between the sixth and the seventh. And the interlude between the sixth and the seventh trumpet is by far the longest. So, <coughs> excuse me. What position did he start? He didn't start. Oh. I'm sorry, I missed that conversation. Well, he was, that's what I was told he was starting. But it, their county's red, so we're not allowed to go. Just parents. Two. Gotcha. So, he didn't start, so I don't know what the story is behind that, so I'll, I'm sure I'll hear. <laughs> Any questions about these first four? Nope. The other thing is, and I hadn't, I just, I just thought about this. If you look back to verse 5, it says, Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire and the altar, and threw it to the earth. In that last sentence, and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and earthquakes. And I talked about how last week that kind of has this imagery of shaking the earth from the prayers of the people. But you also can see that playing out Noises, thunderings, lightnings, and earthquakes. Well, look at these four trumpets. The first one sounded, and there was hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. Uh, this notion of noise. Uh, the second one, the second angel sounded, and there was something like a great ma mountain burning with fire, I was thrown into the sea. Uh, the third angel, then the an third angel sounded, and a great star from fell from heaven, burning like a torch. You know, there's that kind of imagery of lightning even there. Um, you know, I think that there there might be some correlation there where he's kind of pulling this back in. Hmm. Any other thoughts before I move on to the fifth trumpet? Nope. I wonder how long this took for him to be told this and write it down. Well, I mean, if you take chapter one, literally, it seems like he had the entire vision in a millisecond. But he, how would he remember all this to write it down in such detail if it was like that? I mean, I guess if God's given doing it, he can do whatever he wants. 
you ever experienced something that was so traumatic that you can't not remember it? Mm. True. Good point. And I don't mean that this is traumatic necessarily in a bad way. No. I mean, I don't remember very many of the details of my wedding day. But I'll never forget the, the image of those doors opening and Melissa being in her wedding dress at the end of the aisle. Hmm. That's beautiful, yeah. Sam. Um, I think he had to write this down right away because there was so much in this. But, but I've also done a lot of research and people who've had visions throughout Christian history uh, most of the time, they spend years writing it out and thinking it out, and they just can't get it out of their head. Mm. It just sticks with you. And so there's probably a sense in which he's writing it down as fast as he can, but also that cyclorama image, he, he, re he remembers this, and so he writes this section, and oh, wait, we got, I remember that, and we got to write that section. Oh, oh wait, I got this, and I got to write that. You know, there's there's a sense in which this it, it was given to him all at once, but there's an unfolding even in how he writes it. So he could have written down for years. It could have. I mean, I mean, you know, he might have written it all down and then God says, now I want you to put it in these four sets of seven. You have seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls you know there there there's a lot of patterns in this yeah and so he may have written it down right away and of course have you are you guys familiar with the story of um uh Handel's messiah yeah have you guys heard that story mm -hmm. Dan yeah, crazy. Uh, the short of the story is he decided to write this piece of music and he sat down to write it and the story goes that he wrote the entire thing the entire score in like 28 days mm -hmm. start to finish. and he just worked almost non-stop yeah he locked himself in a room yeah he like locked himself in a room and he just worked on it worked on it worked on it um and you know it's like it's a book it's i mean i've i've held a copy of messiah in my hands just the the music for singing part. We're not talking about all the instrumentation and all of the, he wrote the entire thing, the orchestration in, a, in less than a month. And I mean, it's, he said, when asked about it, he said it was almost as if it was handed to me, just downloaded into my brain and I had to write it all out. I think if God inspires you to, to write something down, that's probably the way it would be. Mm -hmm. I, and I think that, that, that there's something probably very similar to that in this. I'm um, inspired to do something, not write something, but to do something. And it's, 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 um, it's a, it's a drive that you don't seem to be able to control. It's something that you have to do. Right. And that's kind of the picture I get with, with this. I mean, I was going back over chapter one today. I, like I said, I was working on that cyclorama piece. And when you read chapter one, I mean, it ends with God telling John, it's, it says, uh, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Write these things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the, which the things which are will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. You almost get this impression. Jesus touches him on the shoulder, says, okay, get up. It's time to start writing. Um, 
and it's okay to write because I, who am above it all, am giving this to you. And then he's, and John's like, well, where do I start? What do I start with? And he goes, well, let me, let me give you this piece. The seven stars and the seven lampstands are these things. So you can get started now. Now you can move forward. Okay, here's your starting point. You know the rest of it. Let's go. And it's all, it, you know, the, it, all, it implies this compulsion to do this. I mean, this is, well, for instance, I, I don't know if Bob and Sharon, if you guys saw Sunday service or not. We did. When, you know, I, I have the whole service on my tablet and I put it in a Word document so that whenever I'm reading through the liturgies, I can always find my place. And I've been trying to do a lot more research in my, in my sermon since we've got less going on in the church. I have more time, so I've been putting okay. into my sermons. And I, I have an outline most weeks, but you'll notice also most weeks I never use it. I still very much want to be authentic in what I'm preaching. And as I looked down, as I was walking down to say the prayer before the sermon Sunday, I noticed on my clock, it said 920. We had done everything that normally takes 35 to 40 minutes pre-COVID was done in 20 minutes. Mm. I'm like In my head, I thought, well, this is going to be a short service. And I said my prayer and I started preaching. And I looked back down at my notes and it was 10.02. And I said my prayer, and we sang our last hymn, and we got out. The service was done about five or six after 10. I preached for 42 minutes without really even looking back at my notes and without feeling like I was preaching that long. I figured it was another 15, 20-minute sermon like most of mine are, but it wasn't. You know, I liked that, though. If you have something that you feel something that you feel preach. led to preach. I mean, I'm not interested, I mean, I'm not interested until 3 o'clock in the afternoon, afternoon maybe. maybe. But, but I don't feel like you, I don't feel like any pastor should be tied to a clock if they're led to preach. And, and I appreciate that. Yeah, you are not the majority. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately. <laughs> I'll assume that's experience speaking. <laughs> This church is less tied to the clock than most that I've served. Uh, but there have been a couple of times where Tim Harding said, hey, I'm supposed to be starting Sunday school at 1015. Mm. <laughs> you know, um, and he's joked that they've talked about, man, Sunday school is really short today because, but it's usually on communion Sunday and that we always go over on communion Sunday. But um I, I say all that to say I get this reality of you've got something to say and you've just got to say it. And it takes however long it takes. Um, and he writes this down and he has to write down the whole thing to the best of his ability. And we'll notice sometimes he's very exact. And sometimes it's more fluid. And there are even a couple of moments where God tells him very specifically, that's sealed. We're not talking about that. You got to see it, but you're not writing that down. And then there are other times where he says very clearly, you've got to write this down. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, so that we're in a section now that's a little less exact. It's a little more nebulous, but I think it's, it's speaking about general realities and like i said whenever i whenever i uh, watch my professor thing and he says the two-thirds number was well, it's, it's talking about the one-third but you know you can learn as much about what's going on by what's there as as opposed to what's not there mm -hmm. and and i never put that together two-thirds is six 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 and he said yes in the Greek world, they did have decimal points. 
So there was, there's an illusion here without him actually saying it. There's a precursor here. You know, last week we talked about the perception and the forehead and, you know, this, this reality of being sealed on their forehead, those who were gods. Uh, and we're going to move into that mark of the beast here soon. That, that is the opposite of it. And so we're already seeing this illusion. Two-thirds, one-third. Two-thirds, one-third. Those who are sealed for God, those who are sealed as part of the fallen Babylon. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. Well, let's hop into uh, chapter 9. And uh, my first paragraph is the first six verses. Does that jive with you guys? Yes. All right. It says, then the fifth seal... Or then the fifth, sorry, <laughs> we're talking about seals. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star falling from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the tor torment of a scorpion when it stink strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. Sounds unpleasant. It sounds very unpleasant. So, what what stands out to you in this? What does the five months represent? seal on their foreheads stood out to me so we got i think we're going to work backwards because do you have your notes about numerology sharon not here upstairs not here. i'll go get them i can't remember what the number five is i don't either let me y'all talk <laughs> <laughs> while she's away um what other things stand out to you? So we've got the num the five months piece. We've got the mark on their forehead. Anything else standing out to you or anything else you find odd? The key to the uh, shaft. I just thought, well, who would want that thing? Because <laughs> it says the bottom of this pit. Well, the two in that hell, who would want that key? Well, and, and that's that's a, another thing we need to talk about, absolutely. Uh, I want to wait till Sharon gets back before I start to, to, to explain them. Bob, anything stand out to you? No, I'm sitting here trying to digest it. Okay, I'm on the second flight of stairs. <laughs> You're still <laughs> connected with your headset. We can hear you. Yeah, I can hear y'all too. <laughs> Okay. So as I'm looking here, kind of work from the start back down to the, to that point so we can discuss the five months. Uh, the second sentence, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. What, what does that make you think of? No. Yeah. The bottom of the pit is absolutely talking about hell. Yes. Yeah. The fallen angel. It's a fallen angel. Satan. Is, well, say that again, Sharon. Satan? Satan? Yes. So this, if we were trying to think chronologically, this makes no sense whatsoever because when did Satan fall? Satan was the beginning of time. At, right. Before 
we were ever created. So the first four trumpets are all dealing with realities within time to the created order. But here we see with the fifth trumpet, so the, sec the second set, the three at the end, we're already getting a glimpse that was beyond time. So Satan here, and I saw the star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Um, you know, this has that imagery. What it, where is it from? Is it Isaiah, uh, where we have the story of the fall of Lucifer, and he's the morning star, uh, you know, his, mm -hmm. his name that's given to him. And so you have this imagery. And, and Dan, you're right. Who in their right mind would want a key to hell? Yeah. And yet, what do we say about that time period whenever Jesus was crucified? When he, he died and he went, descended to the dead? Yeah. He took and from he to hell. the keys to hell and death. Mm. What about the keys? That Jesus took the keys of hell and death from Satan. Satan no longer has them. And yet there was a time period when Satan did have it. And you notice then, so from that point, um, he opens this reality. Satan's fall, it, he opens the pit. And the pit was never meant for humanity. She found it. Grace. Five bent grace. Ten Five. bent double grace. Or grace. Okay. Five is great. Let's see how that plays in as we kind of walk through this paragraph. So there's a reality. Um, the next sentence, verse two, it says, and he opened the bottomless pit and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. There's almost How, this reality. What, Robert? Where did the smoke come from? Well, burning. I, from Hell's supposed to be on fire. Yeah. Well, smoke. I'm not for sure if hell's really on fire. I'm not either, but isn't that the metaphor? There is a metaphor, but fire is often an image of God, that God comes as a refining fire. Well, this fire stinks. <laughs> the smoke, it doesn't mention fire, it mentions no. smoke. And it stinks and it clouds things. I think that this smoke is... Satan fell from earth, fell to earth, and he convinces humanity to sin. He unlocked the smoke that stinks and clouds up existence. Like a smoke screen, he confuses. There you go upstairs. And anytime we're sitting next to a fire, the fire doesn't hurt. The smoke hurts my eyes. The fire warms. I mean, of course, it, it can be consuming, but yeah, oftentimes the smoke, people often don't die of being burned alive. They die of smoke inhalation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And stuff That's true. Mm. And so I think that what it's getting at here is when Satan fell, God gave him the ability to tempt humanity with sin. And unfortunately, humanity chose to sin. And that smoke, that putridness, affects all of humanity. Uh, and, it's, and if you think about that, if you look at that imagery, it plays out really well. It says, then the smoke, then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth. And to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. So the smoke and this locust that come out of it become a plague on those who are not sealed by God. Which would only be a third. 
which would be two thirds. Which would be a third. A third, or, or yeah, a, be a third. It'd be a third. The the imagery here being that that Satan brings with him this plague of smoke and locusts, smoke that causes us not to be able to see or breathe right, and locusts that are plague that kind of devour things. And I think that this, the locusts and the smoke are symbolism for sin. Mm. Because it's, you know, we sin and we mourn our sin, but for those of us who are sealed by God, we know our sins are forgiven, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And I mean, he says very clearly these this this group of locusts this that comes out of the smoke is not allowed to touch those who have chosen the perception, the seal of God. So, what is the seal? Well, as we discussed last week, I think the seal is this notion of living in God's kingdom, this living the godly life, studying God's word, seeking to obey it. Um, you got something to add again? You know how you said that um, it would spirit the only man that has the mark of God on right. his forehead? Huh. Madison just said uh, the, how this, the, these things won't affect the one who has the seal of God on their forehead. And she just made a, a connection to Ash Wednesday. Interesting. How we, on Ash Wednesday, we take our sin and we burn it and we take the ash and mark our forehead to remind ourselves. Um, go ahead. Do you think, are you interpreting it for the seal on the forehead to represent uh, the, the mental thought process, the choice to follow Christ? Or, is, or do you think it's literally a seal on our forehead? I think it's that moment by moment choosing to follow Christ. Me too. It's it's, not and we think of the think of the forehead as where the cranium is, where the brain is, where the thought process is. Yes. I don't think that it's and and again for me, this is not a once saved, always saved kind of concept. We are we are saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. It's a living your life daily having your thought process focused on God, being sealed in God, knowing scripture, knowing Jesus's teachings, knowing the, the kingdom way of living in such a way that it becomes your mode of operating. That's what's going on here. And so, you know, yeah, we do things like Ash Wednesday where we put the ashes on the forehead. That's a symbol, but... To me now, as Madison has pointed out, that's going to have much more meaning this coming Ash Wednesday. Mm -hmm. You know, because here out of the smoke and ash come these locusts, the sin and the consequences of sin that really are only affecting those who have not taken the mark of Christ, which is why on Ash Wednesday, I do the sign of the cross. I do a little bit of cross on the forehead with those ashes. Man, there's a lot of symbolism in that. And maybe that's why they do it that way for Ash Wednesday. Maybe this is where it came from. We had never attended a denomination, a church denomination that did that. And it was really very moving for me. Well, thank you. I'm glad it was. And like I said, for me this year, it will be even more so than what it has been. Uh, <laughs> Are you going to do it on people's foreheads this year with COVID? I'm not even trying to think about that yet, Don. Okay, sorry. <laughs> we, can, we can use rubber gloves, but it's still going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on what COVID's doing, and regretfully considering the possibility of the worst case scenario, 
in the same manner that people now can participate electronically with taking communion, it's the spirit and the action that is the communication, the communion. Why couldn't we use a magic marker on our forehead with the right mental intent in communion on Zoom or something if we can't get together? It's a possibility. So there's two things going on. On the one hand, I think I agree with you that as we gather together in this fashion, we are together in Christ. Mm -hmm. Even though we are separated by space and there will be people who watch this on my YouTube channel until I take it down. Um, separated by time, we are still united in Christ. And I think that's important. And so I think there is a sense in which you're right. It doesn't necessarily have to be the bread and the cup or communion. It doesn't have to be the, the ashes. Uh, For most of us, that would be more deeply spiritual. And I think that it's meant to be the primary way. Because the other part of all of those actions is... The thing that's different about Christianity than any other religion is we are meant to be about the community. Mm -hmm. Body. And so. And like, I don't know if you guys have ever realized, but if you watch a speech or a sermon online, it doesn't take the full effect as it does in person. Mm -hmm. And I feel like even though like you might we might be like this. I feel like being in person with each other as as a community. I feel like the whole like connection is very important. Me too. Like, I can't I can't watch church service online. I have to go to church. It it I can't do it. It's not the same for me. I don't I think there's a sense in which it is in this season and in seasons of our life, it's an acceptable substitute. Yeah, it's not the same as going to church. I agree with you. I think we all. But it's better than not doing anything. It's, it's better than not doing anything, but I, it's not the same. I but I, I just always have to make sure I'm making that caveat. It. If you ever get to a point where you think me watching service on on line or on TV, me taking communion in my home with just me in my household, me experiencing Ash Wednesday where I put the ashes on myself or my family puts them on me and I put them on them. If we ever get to a place where that's okay, mm -hmm. that's scary. Then I, we've missed the point. Yeah. Well, we were created to be communal. Um, that's it. You know, for people who, you know, for the pioneers who were out by themselves, that that was what they did. You know, you had to do it within your family. And, and that's okay, but it was never meant to just be about me and my family. It's meant to be about the body of Christ. Absolutely. Uh, universal, not, not just Methodists or Baptists or Catholics, but all of us together. And I think that that's probably... Um, what Satan has attacked the most in this season mm -hmm. is the unity. And, and I'm not saying we were unified. Don't get me wrong. Prior to COVID, we, as the body of Christ was as divided as it's ever been, but he's made us even more so because of this virus. Which makes us weaker. And so... I, th I think you can do communion that way. I think you can do, you can experience Ash Wednesday that way. Man, I, I've got a, there's a, a, a couple in the church that wants to have their child baptized. The child's now eight months old. But they want to do it in a private ceremony with just their family outside of service. It really needs to be with the body of Christ. 
And technically, if they're all believers, then it is the body of Christ. Sure. But you know what I like about at the church having these, um, I can't think of the right word, procedures. Um, Celebrations? Okay. Is when the pastor leads the congregation into commitment to help that child grow up in a Christian atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a community commitment. Exactly. I, I feel very strange. I might do a, a child dedication with just the parents or just the parents and grandparents, but I feel we're doing a baptism where we say we are initiating this child into the body of Christ if the body of Christ is not present. Right. Is this because of COVID? It is. Could uh, it be on Zoom? Better than nothing? I mean, well, the child's growing older from the point of view of the parents. The, it, that, that's a part of it. And I think, you know, I, I asked them about possibly Zooming it and maybe showing it on, on the next Sunday. I asked them, well, what if you invited just like one or two families from the church that you have strong relationships for them to be present so that it's more of the body. And they kept leaning towards it just being their family. Mm. And I will probably go ahead and do it, but I'm not going to feel good about it. Uh, yes. well, I, I can see a dedication, but baptism, I don't know. I don't think they're recognizing the point. And and I don't think they are either. And being real honest, I don't want to say a whole lot because I don't want to give a whole lot away, especially since this is being recorded. But the parents don't come very often. The grandparents come or did come before COVID. And, and so, you know, there's that sense of the loss of that, like you said, that communal connection. When, when a person is baptized, yes, there's a sense in which it is deeply personal. It is their baptism. But it's also deeply communal because they are being baptized into the community of believers. And the community is remembering their baptism, recommitting to their baptism, and as you said, committing to, to be a part of the baptism of that individual as they are formed into the faith. As we were just talking, bringing it back to Revelation that notion of the seal on their forehead is an ongoing process mm -hmm. that is only really done well within the community of the body of Christ. Yeah, that it takes a village to raise a child. It takes the body to raise a disciple. And yeah, usually back then the entire village went to the same church. Yes, there's some truth to that. Well, I mean... If you think about it, you're helping to raise this child along with everyone, and you're trying to help them raise them up in the church as they should be. And when did that, like, saying originate? It takes a village to raise a child. I mean, back then, everyone went to the same church. Everyone had around the same beliefs. So it... Yes, yeah. but we are derailing from Sorry. the scripture. Any final thoughts on that before we come back to the scriptures? Uh, because I said I wanted to try and get through the end of chapter 9, and it's already almost quarter after. So. Yeah, thanks. Um, so quickly, I'm going to reread, uh, I guess it's verse 5. And they were not given in authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the tor torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. Thank they you. will desire to die, and death will flee from them. So if we're talking about the locusts being kind of a consequence of sin, have you ever been around somebody who's so tormented by their sin that they actually want to die? Mm. They're so mired in their own struggle. Um, and I would venture to say this is probably why uh, I, not everybody. This is not a blanket statement, okay? 
but many who end up taking their own life do so because of the consequences of sin in their life. Guilt, shame, not being able to deal with the, the consequence of their addiction, their struggle. Um, I, 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 I've come to really believe that this, this smoke and locust is a symbolism for the plight of sin in our life. And so to answer your question, Sharon, about the five months, you know, there's a sense in which I believe God lets us go through a lot of things in our life as a grace to us, that it pushes us to him when we allow it to do so. And if we don't allow it to push us to him, then it becomes something where we want to take our own life because we just can't stand to deal with the consequences of our own actions. And so I think that there is a push here. There is symbolism in this. The consequences of sin in our life and the consequences of our sin on other people and the consequences of others' sin on us will either push us to God, it becomes a grace, or it becomes that which wants to destroy us. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, trying to move, speed up a little bit, I guess. Well, uh, the next paragraph is 7 through 11. And it says, the shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth, and they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in, in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months, and they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abandon, but in Greek he is the name Apollyon. You know, if you think of, of uh, that symbolism where the, the locusts are are the effects of sin, you know, it says on their heads they were crowned something like gold, this reality that, that our sin oftentimes rules over us. Uh, they had faces like men and hair like women that oftentimes the plight of our sin looks like other people. We have, uh, you know, the first time sin enters the world, what happens? Eve blames the serpent and Adam blames Eve and then they start to blame each other and um, I think there's there's something there that this notion of you can't just fight it the way we would normally fight things. A breastplate of iron is something, you know, that um, they didn't have guns back then that could shoot through a breastplate. So, you know, it was, it was a well-defended thing. Um, you know, this the sound of their wings beating, the sound of sin approaching was like the sound of chariots and horses running into battle. I think there's a lot of imagery here that just talks about the, the overwhelmingness of the consequences of our sin and how it seems to be all around us. Um, I mean, if you've ever done something wrong, if you remember what, uh, when you were little and you couldn't stand to be around your parents because you knew you were going to be found out and there was guilt in that. Uh, you know, we, we have all this imagery within our, within uh, Hollywood and TV shows and movies, how they see the person that they've wronged and the crowds all around them, you know, this, this overwhelming sense of, um, well, I think of Psalm 51, my sin is ever before me. And, and you kind of get that picture with these locusts. Um, And of course, it says, and the king, they had a king over them, and it was the angel of the bottomless pit. This is, 
the king of sin is Satan. Yeah. And both of those words, apparently, Ab Abaddon and uh, Apollyon, mean destruction. My Bible has a little footnote down here. It says that both of those mean destruction. Which, again, that's what Satan wants to do, isn't it? He wants to destroy. Uh, I think that's why they use, uh, that's why he's using the symbolism of locusts. They think of a plague of locusts. Locusts come in and they just strip everything bare. And they eat all the green off of the trees and the grass and everything. I mean, when a, when a plague of locusts came through, there wasn't anything left. And you get this symbolism, I think, in that, that that's what sin will do to our lives if we allow it. Hmm. I always think of, um, this is a strange imagery, but did you ever um, pay attention to somebody that was like, let's say the Mickey Mouse Club, you know, and they were these pure girls that... Innocent. Yeah, innocent, and they were just so sweet, whatever. And then they get picked up by some big, you know, to, to, to do music, because they were always singers, you know, to, to do something. And then you just watch them as the time goes on, and they get more makeup, and their costumes get more seductive. And pretty soon, they're, they just don't even look like the same person anymore it's like the sin has moved in and it just destroys them there was a song it did it didn't become very popular uh even amongst christian circles uh it's probably about 15 years old it was written by a christian artist and, he, and the, i think the title is it uh i'm sorry Brittany." And he was talking specifically about Britney Spears. Yeah, that's a good example. And that concept of what you were just saying, how we we lifted you up and then we tear you down. And we watch the whole way and nobody steps in to say, I'm sorry. And very few people step in to help her navigate all of that, that fame and fortune brought with her. And, and no one was there to be the friend instead of just the consumer wanting to take. And I may have to look that song up. I mean, it, it was a, like I said, it was a very powerful song, but I don't think it ever became popular because I don't think we liked the message. Mm -hmm. But when and a person like that des destroys, we say they're destroying themselves. But there's a sense in which we as the, the populace have helped them destroy themselves and i thought of miley cyrus when you said that oh yeah in the very beginning she was such an innocent little thing and it didn't take right. just like that there's several of them and you can just watch and you just they just it's, it's like it's they're dying from the inside out mm -hmm. and and we do it to them the culture we 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 set them up for failure I agree that the culture we does that and probably has the majority of the responsibility, but there's also hanger honors everywhere. And when these beautiful young women start making money, there are people who want part of it and it, it just gets really nasty. And it's not just the women. I think of uh, Justin Bieber, yeah. who actually has ties to the Tell City. I don't know if you knew that or not. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Roy Kramer that um, Rory Kramer that owns McDonald's. Mm -hmm. uh, one of his brothers, Rory, is the nephew, I think, of the guy of the the one who owns McDonald's. He actually became a, a filmmaker, and he's a great friend of Justin Bieber's, and he was Justin's uh, one of his. Filmologists, I guess you'd say. He was the one who went around and filmed everything for him. Justin has been at the Kramer's house here in Tell City many times. Um, but yet you watched his life and the same thing happened in his life. 
you know, um, yeah. it's not just the women. It's it's we our culture will lift you up and chew you up and spit you out. Well, and I feel like if yeah. you start at a young age and you are getting a lot of attention, you have a high standard to be held to, and then it's harder to keep that standard the older you get because there's more things being thrown at you. And it doesn't help at all. So, sorry, I didn't get, mean to get us off. I was just. No, it's okay. I think, but I think that that plays into what what this fifth trumpet is talking about. You know, there's a reality that that Satan and the fallen Babylon will paint you in this picture. They'll give you this sense in which everything is good, and yet what they're actually giving you is death and disease and torment. And verse 12 kind of sums it up. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. There's a reality in which the, the first woe is the, the reality of the brokenness of sin that Satan in his fall came down and brought to us. Now, we can try and blame him for it, but we still choose it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Choice. He might have been the mover, but we're not innocent in, in that. Yeah, I agree. And I think a lot of the promoters is guilty of, of this, too. This is what the people want. This is what you should do. And that starts it, and then it just goes from there. But the almighty dollar is what it all comes down to. And, of course, the dollar represents power yep. and privilege and authority, and yet we know, right, what, what, what does Proverbs say? The love of money right. is the root of all kinds of evil. Of all money right. itself is not evil. And money itself does not always lend itself to evil, but the love of money is often what starts that root, that blossoms in this case in the symbolism of the ugliness of sin yep do we want to wait and do the sixth trumpet next week or do you want me to go ahead and do it i'm gonna go watch my grandson we'll save it for next week then Thank okay you. so let's say a prayer and we'll end right there Heavenly Father, I just pray that, uh, Lord, the consequences of our sins, the consequences of our actions will be that grace to us, that will drive us to you, and that we might experience your love and your mercy and your forgiveness. Lord, I pray that you would seal us with your blood, that we might not live lives that lead us to the pit, but, Lord, that we would be amongst the hosts of your redeemed. Lord, may we encourage those around us to join those ranks as well. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I'll Thank be you, praying Sam. for everybody to stay safe and healthy and um, to grieve well. There's a lot of people grieving.